Good evening, Ethan Government, and welcome to the 2014 debate. My name is Ross Cameron, and we're going to go ahead and start off by introducing the candidates to my right. Hi, everybody. My name is Lena Gavanis. I'm from the South Pasadena San Marino delegation, and I'm running with the Block Party to be your 67th youth governor. Hi, Ethan Government. My name is Rose Meinrath. I'm with the Sacramento delegation from the Capital Coalition, and I'm running with the Grizzly Party to be your 67th youth governor. Hi, my name is Dana Dupuy, and I'm running unaffiliated from Conejo Valley delegation, running to be your 67th youth governor. Thank you for joining us. And now to my left. My name is Grant McComb. I'm from CCY, and I'm running to be our youth governor uh, with the Wonka Party. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Vidovich from SPPY Dubai, and I'm running with the Search Party to be your 67th youth governor. Thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and start off with the first single question. Uh, currently in youth and government, there is talk about splitting California into six separate states. What kind of implications would this have, and how would, you, how would it affect your, your leadership position as governor next year? Thank you for this question. Um, while this originally may seem like a good idea as uh, each part of the legislature would be able to focus more effectively on each part of California's economy, I have some issues with this just in the pure application of it um, and most of them come down to costs. Like we would have to declare new capital cities, we would have to build new capital buildings, um, and would the funding for the UC system be divided evenly among the states? Uh, could prisoners from West California, the new West California, uh, go to state prisons in Central California? There's just too many technical problems that I wouldn't be able to fully support this bill. As it goes for my position as governor, I don't believe that I would be able to, uh, I believe that it would be too, uh, each state would be too uh, separate from one another. And I think that we need to preserve the unity that we see now in California's youth and government. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Lena. And just as a reminder to the audience, we have one minute per answer. Uh, now to you, Rose. I know a lot of proponents of this bill are talking about the electoral college system and how this would bring more fairness to the citizens of California. However, I think that this is an issue that should be dealt with on its own. Popular votes is an issue in regard to the electoral college. However, this does not mean that we should split up California. This could set a precedent. So Texas, for instance, could split into 50 states, and then they would have uh, 100 senators in the US Senate. This is simply not feasible. Also, Northern California sends all of its water down to Southern California. So how would Southern California have a water supply? There are just so many uh, unrealistic implications with this bill. And so that's why I, I would not support it as youth governor. Thank you. Uh, now to Dana. My biggest problem with this is that there are parts of California that rely on other parts of California economically. And splitting California up into six different states, or any different amount of states, would severely impair that, that bond that they have developed over the years of California statehood. Uh, it would also create uh, an, a, a huge upsetting problem because there wouldn't be any more, it wouldn't be 50 states anymore. Uh, and I like the number 50. I think that's a pretty <laughs> cool number. And I think we should stick with it. Okay. And now we're going to go ahead and move to lieutenants on my left. All right. So um, dividing up the states, or dividing up the state is, it's an interesting idea I heard about. Uh, it was proposed to my assembly meeting uh, with an emergency team uh, earlier today. And I, as I was looking at the map of how California would be divided, it just seemed uneven, first of all. So there needs to be more planning going into that if this does go through and if this, if this actually is uh, seriously considered. Um, as previous candidates have stated, California does rely on uh, other parts of California for resources, uh, and that's vital to um, the unity of the state. And California is an incredibly diverse state, and that's what, make, that's what makes California such a great state. All right, Emily? So I am honestly not in favor of splitting California into six states, mainly because the reason California is so great is because we have so many different things in it. We have economic um, um, proponents from all over, and we have different races, we have different environments, and we have different industries. And all that comes together to make us the best state in the nation. So I think splitting us up really would kind of uh, negate the whole beauty of California. And in addition, California YNG in particular is the best YNG in the country. We're the largest, we're the powerhouse, and splitting us up into six, it would really just make us into six smaller, weaker youth and governments. And that would be unfortunate to not be able to be able to meet with 3,000 people from around the state and hear all these different views. It would instead make it so we're only meeting with like a possibly a few hundred people, if that. I think that would be unfortunate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to move on to questions that were submitted. Uh, this one is from Facebook from Ivan Enriquez. If you could visit delegations as while in office, how would this benefit the program? 
Thank you, Ivan. Uh, a big part of my platform is talking about expanding on delegation president meetings so that I can work with officers and advisors within delegations to begin the changes that I think can most effectively begin at the foundation level, which is the delegations themselves. I believe that if I was able to go visit all the delegations, this would just be a great way to implement this new curriculum involving you know, independent informed voting. However, the, the limitations of one person to visit all delegations have to be recognized. That being said, it would be nice to maybe utilize new technologies like Skype uh, or to release a newsletter or even perhaps Spencer Perry's fireside addresses, which were great and I personally enjoyed. Um, just so that communication between the governor's office and the delegations themselves can always continue to increase and improve. Thank you. Uh, Rose? Uh, during my campaign alone, actually, I visited as many delegations as I possibly can, and this is simply for communication. I think this is very valuable for delegates to have a direct sort of communication with their governor and for the governor to have this connection with their constituents. As governor, I would like to do this even more. I have been talking to as many people as I possibly can, shaking as many hands, hearing as much about program areas as I possibly can, and I would like to continue doing this as youth governor. Okay, and we'll move on to Dana. My, one of my favorite parts about campaigning was being able to m visit all of the delegations. I really enjoyed seeing the dynamics of, each, of how each delegation worked, and I would really love to continue doing that as youth governor. I think that one of the best parts about uh, being youth governor is that you get to talk to so many people, and it's something that gets underlooked a lot. And I would like to remain in touch with the delegates as much as possible, and I think that going to the delegations as much as possible would help that. It, they'd understand my platform more as well, which would help when they're writing their bills or proposals that have to get signed by me. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move to the candidates on my left, starting with Grant. All right, to travel to different delegations as a youth governor, I see it uh, very important to establish communication with different delegations, with all the delegations throughout California, because the youth governor is a governor of the people. They have to uh, communicate and keep in touch with the delegates that they're leading. Um, a lot of people have come up to me and say, oh, you're running for the biggest position in youth in government, the flashiest position. Uh, but it's, to me at least, not the biggest position. It's the position that one can help the most delegates from. Um, and to keep this communication strong between the delegates to see how they're feeling, to see what they want done within youth and government is very, very important. Emily? So a big part of my platform is unity throughout California. Throughout my campaign, I got to go to so many different delegations, like all over SoCal and even going up to NorCal to SRV via Lobo. And it's just so great just to be able to see people from all over the state and all their different needs and all the different things that they do in their delegation. And that's why I think as youth governor, it'd be really important just to keep visiting delegations. I know Sam Leitinger actually visited my delegation about a week before Bob, I mean, excuse me, a week before SAC, and just talked to us and kind of just amped us up for SAC. And I thought that was really cool. And that's something I'd like to continue as youth governor because I think it's really important to be accessible and just to be a friend to everyone. I don't want to be a far off leader. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to another question submitted by a delegate from Courtney Brousseau. What is the most pressing issue currently facing public education and what steps need to be taken to alleviate it? Starting with Lynn. Thank you, Courtney. Um, a big thing that we talk about a lot in youth and government is teacher tenure. And while I appreciate the fact that these teachers who are being paid such menial wages need some job security in order to make the job you know, more uh, exciting and to make the job uh, more alluring to teachers that might be dissuaded from taking the job in the first place, we have to remember that teaching is a service job. And who in this situation is being served? It's the students. Uh, but another thing that's also not talked about as much is the neglected health curriculum. Uh, you know, health is something that's sort of like shoved off to the side. You know, you, in some schools you are, it's mandatory that you take it before you can graduate. But oftentimes people take it over the summer and they don't pay attention, they don't listen, they just try to meet the minimum requirements. But it means that we miss a lot of discussion about anti-rape culture. We, meet, we miss a lot of discussion about STIs and about, uh, you know, family planning and about, uh, dealing with you know, a sexually active youth in a way that we haven't in the past, and also dealing with all the new you know, toxins in our environment and what's in the food we eat. It's something that we don't know much about, and I think that we need to fight this ignorance with education. Thank you. See you, Rose. I think the teacher tenure is also a large issue, and it's a very hot topic, but the main issue I have with our current public education system is with the allocation of funds. Not necessarily the funding of education as a whole on the statewide level, but district-wide. I know in the Sacramento School District, $40 per student is spent on legal fees and only $9 on classroom materials. I think this is outrageous and more money needs to be spent in the classrooms. Thank you. And to Dana? 
I think that the biggest problem in our classrooms is that students don't understand why they're taking the classes. They don't understand why they're taking biology. They don't understand why they're taking history. And as someone who loves history very much, I want students to be able to understand that their education is extremely important and it will help them later in life. I think that's one of the main things and I think that it's probably the most important problem facing education and it's not one that can be easily solved. It's not one that you can just throw money at. It's not uh, something that you can just legislate at. It's something that will take direct involvement with the schools. Okay, and now we're going to finish up with the candidates on my left. Sorry, All right, so I'm, I'm going to be totally frank here. Uh, one of the California has one of the lowest ranking school systems in uh, the country. And one of the major problems with that is Prop 13. And uh, that essentially uh, redirected funds from schools that need it the most in California uh, to other programs. And as a result, uh, California is a separate and unequal system of education. Um, so it just loops back around into accountability number one and uh, more funding for the schools so we can get a better quality of education because so many great minds have come from California. We have JPL, we have uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, just to promote and continue this uh, tradition we have of fine education, uh, we need to have this accountability and this funding. Emily? I think the major issue with the California school system is the idea of the standardized test because currently in our schools, where their teachers don't really care about you learning, they don't care about your knowledge, they care about you being able to pass a standardized test so that the teachers look better. I think we should actually focus on teaching kids real world things that they can use and teaching them in a way that they're actually gaining knowledge and gaining experience that will help them in life instead of teaching them just to pass a test. I feel like if we do that, the kids will actually want to be at school and that ultimately is the main goal of education. All right, and that wraps up the question portion of this debate. And now we will be moving on to discussion. And the way this is going to work is each candidate is gonna have one minute to discuss a certain topic. And then after each candidate has discussed a topic, each candidate will say who they differ with the most and then the person that they differ with will have a 30 second rebuttal. Starting with Lena. The, uh, the discussion will be about abstentions. So in youth and government, we've had this huge movement in the past couple of years, especially starting with the one vote difference in an election a couple of years ago for youth governor to not abstain because every person's voice matters. Um, and we always talk about how, you know, there are viable reasons to abstain. For instance, if you have a philosophical uh, complication or a religious um, problem with voting. But another one of the big reasons that people abstain is because either they're uninformed, maybe they weren't paying attention, or maybe they just can't make up their mind because there's often a lot of good candidates for any single position. So when I think about the movement against abstention, I think it's mostly a movement for more informed voting so that people can pay attention more, so that people will, you know, have to choose between these candidates and so that they will most effectively think, you know, what changes do I want to see in the program area next year? And it's mostly just a movement to get everybody involved and I honestly appreciate the no abstention movement. All right, Rose? I think the no abstention movement has good intentions. However, I think that an, the right to abstain uh, is a, a right that every delegate has just as much as they have the right to vote. Um, a vote is the most direct and easiest way to have a voice in our program, and my entire platform revolves around having a voice. And for that reason, I encourage every single delegate to vote. However, I do think it is a right to abstain because you have a right to have your voice not be heard just as much as you have the right to have your voice to be heard. Thank you. Uh, Dana? Well, we're bombarded uh, outside of youth and government and even inside sometimes we're reminded that our generation is labeled the apathetic generation. And I think that this program is doing so much to counteract that label. And I think that people can sometimes misinterpret abstentions as apathy when it is really just maybe I'm uninformed, maybe I uh, have a religious pretense about this, but it is something that we need to address, and it's something that delegates, if, if, you, if you're a delegate who says, or if you're one of those delegates who um, will just shout abstention at the end, like, don't do that. That's, that is apathy, <laughs> that is counterproductive, and we're trying to run a democracy, and that's not, that's not that. Okay, uh, now we're gonna move to the candidates on the left, sorry, I'm Grant. All right, every abstention is a voice not heard, uh, be that for various reasons. Um, uh, previous candidates have brought up uh, not being informed about the candidates, being torn between candidates, or um, just not getting up to vote. And uh, in this democracy, it's crucial that every delegate votes. Um, and that comes with being informed about the candidates and uh, having a clear path to do so. Emily? 
My biggest concern with the uh, no abstentions movement is that it's actually dying out. Because as we see, all the delegates that saw the Matt Tick Ryan Mormon election are getting older, and I'm pretty sure they're all seniors this year. Um, so slowly, kind of the shock of like what abstentions can really do to an election and to the state um, really is starting to die down. I feel like that's something we need to keep alive because democracy really is about getting your voice heard. And so that's why I feel like we should really be encouraging everyone to vote. But at the same time, like a previous speaker said, um, abstention is a right too. But I feel like we should be encouraging people only to abstain when they do actually have like ethical or religious or moral reasons not to vote. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to the more debatey section. Uh, we're going to start with Lena. Lena, who did you disagree with or differ from the most? It's difficult because a lot of us have very similar uh, opinions on the matter, but uh, I guess something that both you and Emily brought up is the fact that you know you have the right to abstain, and that's great. But Emily, you also talked about the fact that the movement is dying out. And while there are viable reasons to abstain, for instance, uh, religious or philosophical, I feel like those reasons are very rare. I feel like most of the time people abstain because they can't choose between candidates, uh, which I believe is unfair to the candidates because you should be giving them enough attention that you have an opinion, um, or because perhaps the delegate is uninformed, or perhaps you people don't fully appreciate the importance of voting, which is something that we need to be stressing even more in youth and government. All right, Emily, that seemed mostly directed to you. Um, <laughs> how do you come back? You have 30 seconds. I completely agree with her. We should be stressing informed voters because informed voters is what is going to take our state, both in youth and government and in the real world, to greater prosperity. Uh, we see in real elections all the time only like about 8% voter turnout, and that is highly concerning. So I feel that stressing voting and informed voting is very important. All right, now we're going to move on to Rose. Remember, you have 30 seconds to say who you differed from the most. Uh, like Lena said, I think we're all sort of on the same page on this issue. However, I had to say there was one candidate I disagreed with most. I think it would be Emily as well. And that's because I, don't, I do not think that the abstention uh, movement is dying out. I think there's actually being amped up more. Every time someone abstains in a general election, people boo. Every time someone abstains, it's very rare. And I think the abstention movement is stronger than ever. Emily? Um, I'd have to actually disagree with what you're saying. Um, I know through my years I've seen all the people booing and stuff, and as I've gotten to this year, and I've, like the Chief Justice election, when there was abstention, like there was less booing, I'm like, oh no, where are the boos? Like someone just <laughs> abstained. Um, so I think it is something we still need to be stressing a lot, that abstentions are something that should be taken seriously and not be done unless there's a very serious reason to do so. Dana, I did you disagree with all this? I really hate to pick on Emily, but I don't have to disagree <laughs> with her that the... Uh, 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 that the abstention, anti-abstention movement is dying out. Uh, every governor's banquet we see delegates go up and give their votes for abstention and it's always booed. Um, so I don't think that anytime soon we're going to see a resurgence of abstentions for governor candidates. However, I do agree that we need to improve um, awareness for abstentions in, on things like proposals or bills. Emily. And sing loud again. <laughs> How do you re That's not you rebuttal? Get um, so what I would like to say is that abstentions are something that even if people are still taking them seriously, there are people who kind of I think sometimes forget that an abstention really is like kind of casting aside your vote at all. And I know I've talked to uh, delegates who are extremely informed, extremely intelligent candidates. I mean, excuse me, delegates who have said that they don't know which delegate, which candidate they are voting for because they know that everyone is so informed. And they're like, I've talked to this extremely informed delegate who said, yeah, I think I might just ex abstain because I honestly don't know who to vote for. And I don't think that's right at all. I don't think um, especially informed delegates should be abstaining at all. So I feel like we really should push people to be making their opinions heard, and making their voices heard, and be able to make a decision and uh, have a voice in the elections. Okay, Grant, would you disagree with that? All right, I think it's between Rose and Elena, actually, because um, you can't force people to vote. You cannot push them to make a decision if they're choosing to abstain, because as uh, previous candidates have said, Making uh, or abstaining from an election is a right, and you can't uh, push them to make that choice if they're not comfortable with making that choice. So I think uh, this issue is more um, education and making sure all the voters are informed. Uh, that'll definitely reduce the amount of abstentions um, without trying to push people to vote for a specific candidate if uh, that comes up, because I'm sure that's happened where um, people are trying to push to um, get rid of abstentions, but also for a specific candidate. So that'll kind of take that out of the uh, equation while getting uh, abstentions to a lower point within youth and government. 
So Grant, are you going to toss it to Lena or Rose? Let's go with Lena because we've talked to Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I completely agree with what you're saying. I uh, also take issue with a lot of times the negative way that we skew the influence to vote. I believe it should always be influenced towards the positive. So sometimes when we boo people in general elections, um, it, sort of, it bothers me a little bit because we never know why they're abstaining. My point was basically that more often than not, the reasons for abstention are reasons that can be fought with education. Um, so I just, I think that viable reasons to abstain are uh, few and far between, and that we honestly should be encouraging voter turnout as much as possible in youth and government so that we can take that into the real world when we're all of voting age. Absolutely. All right. Emily, who did you differ from most in your opinions? I'm going to have to say the person I differ the most with is Rose, mostly because uh, I don't think that she, okay, back up. She said that the <laughs> she disagrees with the no abstentions movement, and no matter um, what you think about abstentions, whether you think they're right or whether you think they shouldn't be happening at all, I think we can all agree that we should be encouraging everyone to make their voice heard. So. Okay. Rose? I completely agree. I think that everyone should be encouraged to vote. Um, all I was meant to say was that people have the right not to vote as much as they have the right to vote. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the next discussion topic. Uh, a lot of times we hear from candidates that they do not like the political party program the way it's set up. How would you improve the political party program? Sorry, Elena. Thank you. So I think before we go into this question, it's vital that we recognize the limitations of the Office of Governor. You cannot single-handedly re-envision this entire program, but you do have influence. You do have a vote on the board. Um, and also I want to just recognize some of the benefits of the program. I mean, it was initially instated to help small delegations, and while perhaps it might have backfired a little bit, let's not demonize the entire program entirely. Um, now we can see five candidates go through to Sacramento, and small delegation candidates that do get through preliminary voting uh, do have a larger support group outside of their delegation. Um, that being said, if I could change the program entirely, I would like to see more of a secretive ballot so that there's less opportunity uh, to be influenced by your peers or perhaps incorporate a popular vo vote more than it is now. Thank you. And Rose, just a reminder, you have one minute to discuss the topic. Every year we hear governor candidates talk about the political party system and every year they don't change or they change very minorly. And this is something I would like to change as youth governor. I'm not going to promise that I will eliminate the political party system because I think that would be a mistake. But I would like to implement a few reforms. One of them being having uh, general elections where people not within party lines. So po political parties would be more support systems than a way to vote for your candidate. Um, I don't know, I cannot promise that I can do this because every governor has promised this and none of them have delivered. I would try my hardest to do this, but I'm a very realistic candidate and realistically, I don't know how much I can change. Okay, Dana? So my, m one of my main points of my platform is political party reform and my, one of my first things that I will do is sit down with the staff and the delegates who run the program and try and find a middle ground that we can land on and say this is where we want this program to go. We need to see some sort of secretive ballot so that delegates are not being pressured by their, their other the people from their delegation to vote for the delegate that or the candidate they that they might know is not the right choice for the job. That's a huge issue. And also, I'd like to see more coverage for the unaffiliated candidates. The unaffiliated convention is as far away as possible consistently. It is always in the theater. It is not on a cycle, and it's extremely hard to get there if you don't know how. So if they simply put it on a cycle, I would be very satisfied. And I think that more people would be uh, more willing to go unaffiliated and see the bonuses that come with it. Uh, Grant. All right, so currently the political party system uh, holds the voting in primaries for youth governor. So you would go to your political party and show your support for the candidate that you wanted to uh, support. Um, I would remove that from the political party system. The political party should not have anything to do with the voting in uh, primaries for youth governor. Uh, the, masses of youth and government, the whole 3,000 should decide which move on to Sacramento. Um, and after those five move to Sacramento, uh, the political parties can work directly with them to um, more represent the individual rather than have the uh, individual try to conform to the party. Um, that'll just give the uh, candidate an opportunity to play a more active role within political parties uh, to get his or her ideas out there. Um, yes. So. I think political parties are great, but they do need some work. 
uh, mainly with how they are run at Bob 2. Because currently, you can only vote for the candidates that are at the convention that you end up going to. And I don't think that's really a representation of a true democracy and of a true um, which five really deserve to go on. Because unfortunately, sometimes two very qualified candidates end up in the same party and only one can get through. So how I suggest to improve this is by at Bob 2 having an online ballot with all of the candidates on it, and then everyone can vote on all of the candidates. And the ones of the top five votes get to go through to Sacramento. Um, from there, those top five candidates would get to choose their political party. Obviously, we'd have to work out the logistics of this somehow. But then political parties would primarily be there as a support system and to campaign for them, which is what they should be. They should have a huge role in how the candidates get to Sacramento. Okay, and just as a reminder to the viewers, uh, the next portion will be a 30-second uh, discussion about what, who you disagreed with, and then the person that you disagreed with will have a 30-second rebuttal. Starting with Lena. So I guess I would have to say, um, again, most of us are sort of on the same page here, but I would have to say that I disagreed most with Grant. Just, um, and also Emily talked about this a little bit, just the logistics of having a popular vote before we affiliate with parties. Um, I love the idea of it because again, I do believe that like parties, the initial voting in parties just has a way of stamping out small delegation candidates or candidates that just can't get as many people to show up. But I just don't see this logistically working out as well as we would envision. All right, Grant, she doesn't like the logistics of your idea. <laughs> I see. Well, if you look at how candidates are run within political parties, you see major flaws. You see candidates that are so worthy to go on to the next round being knocked out uh, because of the way political parties are set up right now and because only a few candidates can go to each political party and represent the candidate they want to go to. They might want to support, let's say, um, two different candidates and they want them both to go on to the next round, but they can't because they're both at different political parties and uh, this problem would be essentially eliminated if the voting is removed from political parties. Okay, uh, Rose, who do you disagree with the most? I'm going to have to say I disagree with the most with Dana and this is because I don't think the largest problem in the political party system is the unaffiliated party. While I think that it does speak volumes that no candidate from the unaffiliated party has ever been elected governor, I do think that there are larger problems, uh, speaking of voting and the political party system in general, not just with the unaffiliated party. All right, Dana, running as an unaffiliated, <laughs> how is, what is your rebuttal? I would totally agree that it's not the biggest problem, but I would say that it is one of the more substantial problems. I think that the biggest problem is certainly the fact that you can be pressured by your peers to vote for the candidate that you do, that you do not believe is the correct choice for the job. Um, but I think that it's a more reasonable goal to fix the unaffiliated problem than it is to fix the uh, election, the primary problem. All right, Dana, we're going to come right back to you. Uh, who did you disagree with the most? I also disagree the most with Grant um, because I uh, think that it is the job of the political party system to elect someone to represent them at Sacramento. That is what the real political party system does in the real world. And I think that if we're going to be a model legislature in court, we need to model that as well. So I think that we need to embrace the flaws of the real political party system, try and change them as much as we can to better our program as well. Grant? I see what you're saying completely. Um, I was in a political party. Um, running with the Wonka party, I ran with uh, Stone and uh, Muller, I think his last name was. I, sorry, I don't remember uh, exactly. And I would have loved to see those two candidates move on with me. But that was not possible because of the political party system as it stands today. Um, delegates have come up to me, they've been talking to me about my platform, talking to me about how the political parties represent me. And I'm incredibly happy that my political party has accurately represented me. And my platform and my political party platform just kind of clicked like Legos or puzzle pieces together. And um, I don't see that happening with a lot of the Gov candidates. I don't see uh, an accurate political party system or a political party system accurately representing the youth Gov. And I think that can happen uh, with them working directly with the Gov candidate after the election. Okay, Grant, we're coming right back to you. Who do you right, differ yeah. from the most? Uh, Dana. Dana, I do <laughs> right. differ with him the most. And I think for the same reasons uh, he actually just articulated. Okay, Dana, you can have another chance. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, I think that since we're a model legislator in court, like I said, um, we need to embrace the flaws of the program or the systems that exist. Uh, that doesn't mean that we need to blind blindly accept them. That means that we should try and work to reform them. And I think that simply eliminating them from the primary election is not the way to solve that. I think that 
informing delegates that unaffiliated is an option is what would be one way to help them out of the mold of political parties. All right, Emily, who do you disagree with? Um, I'd have to say I disagree the most with Dana, uh, primarily because, well, I fully, uh, first of all, I fully support what he's saying about how insane the walking distance for the unaffiliated convention is, and I do feel like that should be changed. But however, in our real government, um, running unaffiliated is way harder than running with a party, and we're supposed to be modeling the government. So I feel like it wouldn't be fair to give unaffiliated too much of a leg up, because as um, kind of controversial as that may sound, it is unaffiliated, and if you choose to run with that, you should have to deal with how hard it is. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to the next discussion topic now. Oh, I'm sorry, Dana. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I think that when I said that we shouldn't blindly accept the flaws, I was, I was sort of alluding to the fact that the political party system that we have in America is terrible. It's a mess. <laughs> and that uh, we should be training our youth to fr think for themselves, not to fall into the mold of Republican or Democrat, but be able to say, this is what I think about on this policy, this is what I think about on this policy and this policy, and I don't necessarily have to agree with 50% of the population. Okay, now we'll be moving on to the next topic. Uh, and the last topic we will be discussing today is the legalization of marijuana. And just as a reminder to the audience, in this segment we will be talking one minute on each, each person will have one minute to discuss the subject, and then we'll have uh, 30 seconds to say who they disagree with, and then there'll be a 30 second rebuttal. Starting with Lena. So one of my biggest problems when we talk about not legalizing marijuana is just an inconsistency in our regulation of certain substances. Um, for instance, alcohol, which is probably worse for your body than marijuana is and more dangerous to the people around you as it can cause some people to become violent. Um, and also cigarettes, you know, cause lung cancer, you know, an addiction in a way that marijuana just doesn't as much. Um, and not only are the people who are caught with marijuana taking up unnecessary space in our state prisons, but they, there's also this huge economic gain that we're avoiding, especially since California is an ag agricultural state. Um, I mean, just look at Colorado. I mean, they had this huge boom in their economy just like in the first day of legalizing marijuana. So I would say, let's do it. All right. I'm going to have to agree. I think right now in our society, there's a large fear of substances. However, we do use substances like alcohol and um, morphine in hospitals, for instance, that are much stronger drugs than marijuana. And when we legalize marijuana, we can tax and regulate this. So I think that the fear will go down and the increased medical use and the increased recreational use will go up in a positive and healthy way. Dana? Uh, I think that one of the biggest problems that California faces when it tries to legalize marijuana is the stigma that surrounds it. And so I think that not only do we need to legalize it, but we need to fund more research for marijuana. We need to actually find out more about it because any studies that have been done in the past will be questioned by people who think that, oh, they're just stoners. They don't know anything. They're not scientists. I'm a scientist who doesn't do weed. Like, that's, that's what scientists are going to think. So we need to do that. And also, I'm in Department of Finance, so I want to look at things from a fiscal perspective as well, and I'm very fiscally oriented, and this would uh, generate the state a lot of revenue, and it's something that we sorely need right now. Okay, Grant. All right, so the fiscal impact of legalizing marijuana would be fantastic. We would create a new source of revenue for the state. Um, the prison populations of minor drug offenders would go down, uh, freeing up the prison systems, and so the prison systems would require less money uh, to take care of the inmates that would not be there because they're not going to get busted for minor drug offenses. Um, I'd like to say I like your idea of studying marijuana a little bit more. Um, uh, and uh, funds that could be uh, generated from taxing marijuana within the state of California uh, could go towards government programs, could go to our education, and could go towards fixing our environment. Um, and that's fantastic. So yes, I am all for legalizing marijuana in the state of California. All right, Emily, how do you feel about legalizing? I'm completely for legalizing marijuana. We've seen the medicinal purposes that marijuana has, and obviously there's a huge recreational uh, following of marijuana too. So legalizing it would boost our economy greatly, just like Lena said we've seen in Colorado. Um, also, I want to touch on what Dana said about more research. I think that's a great idea. I know I read a study a little while ago about um, making 
kind of marijuana pills for patients that kind of gave them the medicinal purposes of marijuana without the high. So I think that'd be interesting because then we'd be able to uh, differentiate between medicinal purposes, purposes and recreational uses and uh, tax them differently. And I just think legalizing marijuana would be a great thing for our state. Okay. Uh, Lena. <laughs> What did you disagree with? <laughs> well, seeing as we're all sort of on the same page once again, um, gotta love these candidates. Uh, I just sort of want to, I guess, talk to Dana a little bit because I really do like your idea. Um, I believe personally that stigmas develop when we don't have enough education about a certain issue. Um, and just maybe say that, you know, when we, you know, first legalize marijuana, maybe allocate some of the tax money to the research so that we're not pouring in money that we don't have before legalization. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. What do you have to say? Um, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. I would totally agree that it's stigma is a result of lack of education, and that's something that happens in everything. It's not just marijuana. It can be other drugs. It can be not drugs at all. It could be political issues. So I would full, wholeheartedly support that. <laughs> Rose? So once again, we're sitting around agreeing with each other. Yeah. Um, but I think I'd also like to talk about the research aspect. There have been new studies that show that cannabis can actually uh, be a cure for cancer. And I think that we should keep on studying this to see the full medical extent of marijuana. Um, I think, in fact, that it, the negative effects of marijuana are being decreased as we do more studies, and the positive effects are being implemented. So I think that I would definitely agree with Dana the most. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Dana, what do you have to say? Uh, Thank you. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> right, Did you disagree with anybody at all? Uh, I'm issue? really sorry, but I didn't. I don't think I disagreed with anyone. I think that uh, I, there were a lot of really great ideas, um, and I like Lena's idea with, of um, using some of the tax dollars to uh, fund research. Uh, I think that that would be a great uh, spending of government funds. All right. This time we are going to be discussing how to fix the drought in California, starting with Grant. Well, uh, the term fix the drought really isn't applicable to environmental issues. We, uh, as people living in a state, living in an environment, we can't manhandle the environment. We can't just flip a switch and turn the water on and it's going to rain. We have to bring overall uh, environmental stability to our state, and that comes through funding it and just general education of our people, uh, how to take care of our environment and um, uh, how we can better protect the resources we have. And as we all know, we are a desert state, so we do lack water. Um, and this issue has come up again and again. Uh, there was a drought in the 70s. Um, and another thing that came up in the, uh, the U.S. Department of Fish and Games Resource Committee meeting was a debate on water. Uh, and uh, California's uh, infrastructure when it comes to water collection is aging. It's getting really old. And uh, that contributes to the water supplies that we have. That contributes to the lack of water we have now. So also uh, putting money back in the infrastructure of the state of California is absolutely essential if we want to have water in the future, um, as well as overall environmental stability that we need to invest in. OK. Emily, how would you cope with the issue of the drought? Well, first of all, I just want to say I completely agree with everything Grant said. Um, and also, I feel like one of the main things we can do to deal with the drought is by just raising awareness about it. Because one of our biggest issues in California and in America is just like the uneducatedness and unawareness of most of the population. So I feel like if we really took to uh, social media, to radio, to television, and raised awareness about this is the drought, this is how severe it is, we only have 20% of the snow caps, and this is how you can help, this is how you can conserve water, I feel like we'd have a huge impact. So, yeah. All right, Lena, what would you do? So I love talking about the drought because it's something that I'm super interested in. Um, and I think it's just, uh, we should take into consideration the fact that it's actually not residents of California that are creating the problem. It's the ag agricultural industry. Um, actually, in LA County, it's something like we've reduced our water by about one third, even though we've had in the past 20 years an increase in population by about 25%. And that comes a lot through education and a lot through new legislation. But unfortunately, oftentimes, this is used as an excuse to not regulate water usage by agriculture. And currently, agriculture is using highly ineffective methods of irrigation that wastes about like 40% of the water. And I think we should start incentivizing a switch to, for instance, drip irrigation that would more effectively use this, use this water and uh, save up a lot of our resources. Thank you. Rose? I was actually asked the same question when I visited the delegation. And uh, their answer was that we should cut the water supply to Southern California. <laughs> um, I don't think this is a good viable option. <laughs> However, I do think that regulating water supply residentially is a great step forward. I know in Sacramento County, we do not have water meters, and so we can use as much water as we want, and we are not taxed on it. I think that there should be a certain water limit that should be heavily taxed above that limit. Dana. 
I think that one thing that we can institute more of is water reclamation centers. Now, this isn't water that's being used for public consumption. It's water that's being used for irrigating lawns or agricultural fields. And we actually had a proposal like this in the Department of Finance. They said it would cost about $200 million per large city. So that's something that we could av we could totally do that in like a Los the Los Angeles area just to give it a test run to see if that's effective or not. And then after we find out if it's effective or not, we could institute it in more and more cities. Okay, thank you. Grant, yes. which of those opinions did you differ from the most? Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's fantastic to hear that we all are environmentally minded and concerned about current environmental issues facing our state. Um, there were a lot of good ideas, water reclamation centers, uh, reinvesting in those, um, talking and informing our uh, agricultural industry in the state of California, uh, educating the masses. All of these are fantastic ideas, and I don't have issue with one delegate here that spoke. Uh, I think these ideas should be combined though. It shouldn't be delegate by delegate or uh, uh, candidate by candidate. These, it, uh, all of these ideas are valid and should be utilized. It's not uh, an issue. This is not an issue that we should be divided on. We can't solve the problem apart. We have to work together to solve this issue. So really, uh, I can't say I have taken uh, issue with any comments any delegate has made here. Okay, then Grant, who would you like to uh, give the chance of rebuttal to? <laughs> I'll leave it up to whoever wants to jump in, because we're all together on this one. Um, okay, seeing as it happened, I'm just going to go ahead and move on. <laughs> all right. Um, so I also think that we all have really great ideas for this and stuff. One thing I want to touch on is Rose's idea. I think that was a fantastic idea of water limits and then taxing people after that water, water limit is hit, because I feel like if we do that, um, then not only are we giving people a moral reason to save water by saying like, hey, we're in a drought, like help the environment, we're also giving them a financial reason, like, hey, if you don't save water, like, you're gonna have to pay us. And I think that is fantastic, so. Okay, Rose. Uh, I completely agree with my idea. <laughs> uh, I also think that it would bring in more revenue for the state. It wouldn't be a great financial incentive um, for the state, but I think for uh, individuals it would be. Okay, Elena, just a reminder, is there anything you disagreed with uh, anything that was said? God, I'm, I mean, we're all, again, same page, uh, sitting around agreeing with each other. These are all great ideas um, as far as education goes, as far as reducing residential and agricultural consumption. Um, I just, I guess, Emily and Rose, uh, you guys touched a little bit more on residential reduction, which, again, I just want to remind everybody that that is something that has been focused on a lot in our recent legislature. Something that's been ignored is agricultural consumption. So maybe take that idea of taxing water after a certain limit and apply it to these larger corporations that can maybe afford it a little bit more than personal residents, seeing as it is not the residents themselves that is that are creating this huge problem. All right, Emily, how do you feel about that? I completely agree that we need to make sure that our agricultural system is being water conscious. Um, also another thing to keep in mind is that California provi provides produce to the entire country. Um, so we need to make sure that we're not harming our agricultural in industry too much by limiting their water supply. Um, just to touch on another point, uh, one of the biggest consumers of water as far as agriculture that goes is the uh, agricultural growth of marijuana because that plant does take a, water, a lot of water to grow and it's highly unregulated. So I think if we pass legislation that kind of regulated that more, that would help save a bunch of water. Okay, Rose. I'd like to say that I uh, agree with all these different <laughs> methods. I think that the drought is something that we can solve comprehensively and not one idea is better than the other, but all of them should be implemented. Um, with that, I guess I'd like to pass the talking stick to Dana to see what you have to say about that. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that it is definitely going to be a combined effort, and uh, that's something that I would like to tie back to my platform because I am running unaffiliated, so I want to have the best legislation passed for this government. I don't want the best legislation passed for the Demo Democratic Party. I don't want the best legislation passed for the Republican Party. I want the best legislation passed for our state. Okay, Dana, is there anything that anybody said that you <laughs> uh, Lena, I have to disagree with you on uh, residential not being as important. I think that it is, that, that agriculture is certainly the biggest offender in this case, but I think that there are certainly instances where people in residential areas have been wasting water. I can name at least one person that I know of who fills 20 gallon drums with water when he hears that there's going to be a drought <laughs> because he doesn't want to have to pay more later. Um, so we need to have more awareness about what a, what effect that can have on our environment. 
Yeah, totally. I completely agree with that. Residential usage is something that needs to be continued to be addressed in our legislation. Um, I guess my point was mostly that we shouldn't use residential legislation as an excuse to not regulate the agricultural industry, just keeping in mind that it is agriculture who is the biggest offender. And also a little bit about your point. Yeah, we do produce uh, a lot of produce for the entire country. Um, but maybe if we incentivize like using less water as opposed to like harming these companies because it is our biggest export, um, we could most effectively deal with this drought. Okay. So I'm gonna actually jump in really quickly and talk to you about what you just said. Uh, instead of incentivizing, it comes through education because water reaches us all. If a lot of people think you turn on the faucet and water comes out, but they don't actually understand where it comes from or the efforts uh, people take to get it to us. So uh, while incentivizing uh, the agricultural industry to use less is a fantastic idea. If somebody turns on a faucet and water doesn't come out, it's gonna scare people. And that being said, uh, water touches us all. So we uh, will have to have uh, better education when it comes to environmental regulation and uh, just environmentalism on the whole, so people have a better understanding of how this is going to affect us in the future with droughts and current uh, and future environmental uh, issues. Okay. Hey, uh, that we're running out of time now, <laughs> so uh, what do you think, government? It has been a pleasure being here with the youth governor candidates and listening to what they had to say. This has been Ross Cameron. Thank you for watching, and make sure to vote. Good job.